everyone, and welcome back to Nick's Notes, uh, the fourth in my podcast series on Slice of Healthcare. I can honestly say that in the hundreds of press interviews and podcasts and TV appearances I've done in the last seven years because of the, our company Startup Heal and my work in healthcare and health tech, this is honestly a, a, the most exciting moment for me. Um, I have with me a special guest, uh, Dr. Krishna Shinoy, um, who is a endowed chair at Stanford University, and perhaps more importantly, in my own particular case, he's, he's my closest, dearest, and oldest friend of 33, 34 years now, and uh, we've our kids have grown up together, and we've grown up together, and so it's an incredible privilege to have him here. Um, Krishna, why don't you just start by giving a one-minute overview of what what broadly is the field of neural prosthetics that you've spent your life in? What, what is it all about? Sure. Well, thank you so much for the overly kind introduction. It's a super pleasure for me to be here. And I think the easiest way to set the general tenor is to... Um, Imagine how we feel when a parent or a relative or a friend uh, has a spinal cord injury and cannot move their arms or legs, or maybe a stroke and is not able to move or even talk, and how little we can do to help people like this. And the reason is, is that while the brain is an organ, just like the liver or the kidneys, we understand so little about it. And that's the pursuit of neuroscience. That's the basic neuroscience. But as we're learning about the brain, and it will take us probably hundreds of years to really understand it, but as we learn more about it, we can start interacting with it. We can start eavesdropping on electrical signals from individual cells in the brain called neurons, and when a person wants to move their arm to the right or to the left, those signals are still in their brain, even if it can't come out of their brain and down the spinal cord into the arm. So we can take those signals out. We can then marry that together with modern uh, integrated circuits or computer chips to implement uh, math, so-called uh, algorithms or machine learning. And we can use it to do a whole variety of things like move robotic arms, type on computer screens, and really restore lost motor function or communication function. And this is this great excitement in the field that it's now actually possible to do these things. Well, you spent the last three decades of your life working in this field, along with a lot of other scientists, and you're obviously incredibly accomplished, you're an NIH pioneer and an endowed faculty and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute principal investigator and grants from NIH and DARPA and everyone in between. And I've read about this work as your friend, but in this last few weeks alone, there's been more press about the breakthrough work that you've been working on with, along with others. What is it, what caused all that press? What, why are you on the cover of Nature? What, what was a breakthrough? Yeah, well, there's uh, both a microscopic and a macroscopic answer to that. Let me, let me start with the big picture, the macroscopic. And that is that a number of things are coming together here in 2020, 2021, 2022, that uh, surprise even me. And one thing is that these systems, these brain machine interfaces or brain computer interfaces, uh, they mean basically the same thing. Brain-computer interfaces is what I typically say. Uh, have come such a long way that people are seeing these and saying, hey, I might actually want that. Uh, it actually works well enough. I could type it two-thirds the rate I could type before. Or I could move an arm out and not just pick up a cup, but feel it. Okay. And I don't have to have a big connector skin sticking through my skin, I can have a whole fully implantable wireless system. And there's companies now that are going after this with huge resources that we can talk about if you wish. 
so there's this collision in a wonderful way of all these basic science and engineering and business and venture capital money all coming together to really accelerate this effort that's going on. Now, our little piece of that puzzle, the microscopic view, is that we work at trying to really understand the basic science and then really interpret that language of the brain, really so-called decode that electrical activity really well so that we can sustain that performance, uh, achieve that performance. And that's, that's where a lot of the magic happens, but the technologies that involve uh, having tiny little electrodes that are neurosurgically implanted in the brain to measure those signals is extraordinarily important as are more complicated so-called effectors, meaning arms and sensorized arms and robotic arms and stimulating muscles and so forth. So it's, it's uh, I think for good reason that there's a lot of interest and activity. Uh, and I differentiate that from what uh, we always want to be cautious about, which is uh, it shouldn't become hype or oversold because it is very serious business about helping people with disabilities have proper expectations. So just for, for the audience, just so everyone knows, um, there'll be a couple of links in the, uh, in the below where there'll be links for more reading in a few videos. But the breakthrough that I asked about is, was demonstrated a human being that did not have the use of their limbs, had an implant that wirelessly communicated without uh, wires, that is, to a machine interface that enabled that person to think about the words and letters they wanted to type. And they were able to type, I think, at 35 words per minute. Is that, was that the spec, Krishna? Well, it's, it's uh, no, it's far, far less than that. Okay. It's about 18, but uh, about 18 words per minute. Right. So right. what you're referring to is a paper that Dr. Frank Willett in our group uh, which Jamie Henderson, who's the functional neurosurgeon here at Stanford that I work with very closely, uh, uh, had appear in the journal Nature about three weeks ago. And so the, um, uh, the basic strategy was to have two tiny baby aspirin-sized <clears throat> computer chips that have little electrodes, 100 each, implanted on the outer surface of the brain and the tips of each one of those tiny electrodes only about a millimeter and a half long uh, can pick up on electrical activity from individual neurons and we put this in the area of the brain that is no longer being used because the person unfortunately is paralyzed okay our participant code name t5 for anonymity uh, we put it in the hand and finger and arm region of the brain. So when we ask them to attempt to write the letter A and then the letter B, we can record that neural activity. We can do that many times. We can also ask them to write words. And that's the training data. That's the data that we use to then train uh, a recurrent neural network and hidden Markov model. These are various flavors of what you're hearing about broadly in society these days, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Uh, and it's, you know, it's all statistical signal processing and there's grand traditions of this uh, throughout engineering. And then we can use that to not reconstruct penmanship. We're not interested in exactly how they write the letter A, although that would be cool. <laughs> we could do calligraphy maybe, okay. Instead, what we're after is, can we tell from that neural activity if the person wants to attempt to write an A versus a B versus a C, one of the 26 letters and five special characters. And what we found is, is that we could have the person type up to about 90 characters per minute, which is a roughly 18 words per minute, okay? And it would just stream out on the computer in front of them where it would type like the type letter A and B and C and type 
uh, answers in response to open-ended questions. You know, what did you have for lunch today? Or copy typing and this type of thing. Uh, now, the system that we use does still have the little connector that goes through the skin, although we and others are working on a fully implantable system. But I think the high watermark for that currently is by uh, this company called Neuralink, okay? And many people may be familiar with it because this is one of Elon Musk's companies. And for full disclosure, uh, I'm a consultant there and advisor since the very beginning. And what they recently released about a month ago was uh, a video uh, of preclinical work, which is done with non-human primates, rhesus macaques, where uh, all the medical standards are also used with these animals. Okay, so it's all done very ethically. And what they did was they put in not 100 tiny electrodes, but a thousand. Okay, actually, it's 64 penetrations of threads, and along the length of each one of those so called threads, there are 16 electrodes. So 16 times 64 gives you the 1024, 1024 electrodes. That then goes to a custom low power computer chip, all very, this is all very elaborate and expensive and precision. And then it goes to a wireless transmitter, a so-called radio, which uh, to some people means sort of old timey radio, but radio is actually the word that's used for your Bluetooth, your, uh, your Wi-Fi and everything. So out comes Bluetooth and you can use that to then uh, move a computer cursor on a screen to play Pong and so forth. And the key is that that's all fully implantable. Yeah. Now, why doesn't the battery run down? Well, it does, but so too does the battery. <clears throat> so too does the battery in your toothbrush at home. Yeah. But what do you do? You just put it in the little cradle. There's a couple of coils that inductively, meaning wirelessly, recharges it. Well, that's what we do. You know, imagine wearing like a sleeping cap. Okay. And you recharge it and then you can use it the next day. So I think that that's an example of having, you know, uh, you know, hundred people working full time on it for a few years with right. uh, extraordinary resources. And that's a spectacularly important thing if we want to get these types of systems out of the research labs at universities and into helping actual patient populations. Awesome. So look, I'm going to, in the because we keep these podcasts fairly short, I'm going to ask you three very quick uh, questions. Um, and the, the first is obviously, look, neuro, Elon Musk doing anything gets a lot of publicity, which is brings money to the space. And there's another company this week that was funded by Kosla Ventures in the space and, and others. And, right. Synchron. And, yep. Yeah. And Blackrock. Synchron and, yep. and Blackrock. There's a lot of, a lot of interest in the space and the therapeutic and clinical value to help someone who's paralyzed type on a computer in today's world means they can buy things, they can order food, they can communicate, they can have a job, they can do all kinds of things, right? That's right. Where is the line? But some of these companies are talking about music coming straight into your ears and getting rid of language. And I'm not asking you to pick sides as much as for a scientific researcher like yourself, where is the line between helping clinically helping people who are hurt and enhancing human capabilities? Yeah, that's a great question. So you're, you're quite right. You know, we've been working on restoring computer operation, computer interaction, be it typing or point and click cursor controls and everything. And, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, or even five years ago, you know, it wasn't, sort of nearly as cool as moving a robotic arm that could then feel things and everything, but that's really interacting with the physical world. But if we are honest with ourselves, how much of your life are you spending in front of a phone or a tablet or a computer, right? It's almost embarrassingly uh, <laughs> large amounts of your time, but that's really important because that also helps people feel independent, which is the number one thing they want. Uh, just behind uh, bladder and bowel and sexual function 
is really independence, which used to be expressed in pizza. That's right. (laughs) And it used to be expressed in terms of, I want to move my arm. Yeah. But now in modern society, it, you know, actually you want to use your computer because you can communicate, you can do everything. Okay. Now, where does this line, if we are connected with computers, that, that means with the internet and all these types of things. Okay. And the possibilities are, are pretty large. Where does that line exist between restoration and augmentation? Yep. And for researchers like me, we are exclusively focused on restoration. Okay. And that means that somebody that has a disability, we want to help them regain the lost function, restore the ability to move your arm restore the ability to speak, okay? And really do not aim to provide superhuman arm speed or arm strength or communication ability and everything. Now, with that very important clarification or or statement, it's not as though the scientific community doesn't get that it's a very blurry line and you can cross over it really easily And in in some cases, there's nothing wrong with it, of course. I don't mean to judge it either way. Uh, We do this all the time. Elective surgeries, you know, might somebody that has no disability want an implant? Well, you know, it may sound far-fetched. Restoring vision for people to better than they ever had, right? They're going not back to 2020, but even better than that. That's right. So LASIK, you know, you can just dial it up a little bit and get better vision. Uh, elective surgery sounds a little crazy, but plastic surgery is a real big thing and, uh, more invasive than what we're talking about in many ways. So we have to be careful. We have to be grounded in neuroethics. We have to have these conversations and we have to know what our objectives are. And just like, uh, stem cells, gene therapies, CRISPR technology, we need a ethical framework and that is coming along but it is always hard to keep up with such a fast moving field yep okay so um last question yes or no answer and then i'll make a closing comment because we're coming up on time here uh yes or no answer uh machines are getting smarter humans unfortunately are not um and i could make a whole political comment on that but i won't um do we achieve the singularity in our lifetime no No. Okay. Um, well, you, so, so, you asked for a yes or no. Everyone, so I gave you no. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Shinoi. If you're inspired, uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you very, very much. If you're interested and inspired by this work, as I am, um, please look at the links below. Please look up Dr. Krishna Shinoi and his work or any of the work in neural prosthetics around the world. The, the, the abilities they're giving back to people who are critically injured is phenomenal and exciting and breakthrough. And uh, thank you again, Krishna. Thank you, uh, Jared. Thanks to Slice of Healthcare and hope you enjoyed this, everyone. My pleasure. Thank you.